Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I'm Regina Stanley, and I have the pleasure of serving as the membership coordinator with this congregation. This is a beloved community striving to live its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the healing of the world. We welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientation and gender identities, social and economic situations and abilities, and politics. We advocate for human rights, and we strive to be good stewards of our earth. In living our mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. We honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. Thank you for joining us in person and online. One of the lessons from the past few years is how precious it is to come together, to be with other people, to expand our circles of care and kindness. If you are new, please help us get to know you. Stay for visiting in Fellowship Hall, if you are in person or in the Zoom room after the service. After the service, please take a moment to greet your neighbor. The Sunday after a major holiday always brings a wide range of new and returning people. Please be sure to say hello. Also, take a moment to check your electronic devices and turn them to worship mode, either silent or buzzy. Our guest minister this week is the Reverend Patrick Price. He is the interim minister with the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Quad Cities in Davenport, Iowa. He also is the spouse of our minister, Reverend Jennifer Innes. She is the guest minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign today. It is a pleasure to welcome Reverend Patrick to our pulpit. I have a few notes for this week. After service today, folks are starting to pull out the Christmas decorations. See Jesse Laughlin if you would like to help. Next Saturday, people of all ages are invited to our Deck the Halls from 2 to 4 on December 2nd. We will decorate the great tree that will be here in the sanctuary and enjoy treats and sing carols. Friends and family are welcome too. Next Sunday after service we will be a chance for folks who are LGBTQIA plus to gather and explore creating an affinity group, spiritual development or social connections. See Tim Harold and Jesse Laughlin for information. Now, let us turn to worship with our opening hymn, number 346, Come Sing a Song with Me, found in the gray hymnal or on the screen. Please rise in body or spirit as we sing together.
Becker to please come forward um, for our opening words. On the Brink by Reverend Leslie Takahashi. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink of all that we aspire to create. A deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a deeper joy in this life we share. This morning, Becca and I invite all of you at home or in the sanctuary to join us with our chalice lighting words. We are Unitarian Universalists. This is the church of the open mind. This is the church of the helping hands. This is the church of the loving heart. Together we care for our earth and work for peace in our world. Thank you. Let us now enter into a time of reflection. All are welcome to come forward and light candles with us. If you are in line, light these candles of welcome. Are writ, are wel these candles of welcome are lit for you as well. Please come forward as you are willing and able. <laughs> Mystery of Mysteries, 
We are thirsty for justice and bearing witness to grief, reclaiming our inherent wholeness and healing strands of the great web. We are hungry for liberation and cracking ourselves wide open. We are mourning the dead and fighting for the living. We're singing for joy and striving for meaning. We're embodying love, reaching out in love, acting on love's behalf, and letting that love wash over us, ebbing and flowing as it carries and holds us all. May we do it all over again when the new day comes. We offer the joys and sorrows of the congregation. We begin with a joy. It was a pleasure to share the Thanksgiving potluck dinner with about 52 people on Thursday. There were members and friends, neighbors and family, and people of all ages. Thank you also to everyone who helped with cooking, setting up, and the cleanup. Everybody felt fed in body, mind, and spirit. We turn to matters of health. We extend our wishes for speedy recoveries to Gary Hall, who was taken to the ER for heart issues several days ago. He was admitted as an outpatient and released several hours later. Also for Jean Jost, who was involved in a car accident last Monday. She went to the ER but was later released. She's feeling much better. We offer sympathy and condolences to the family and friends of Reverend David Maynard. He died at home on November 22nd. He was in the company of close family. Long-term members remember Reverend David from his time as the minister with this congregation from 1976 to 1981. Many will remember him for his care and presence. Let's also remember Connor McManus. Um, his grandmother fell and is in the process of healing. Please support Connor and his grandmother. Let us hold one more moment and breathe. Shalom, salam, amen. And now I invite Jesse Laughlin um, to offer the story for today. I have a helper today. Hey, Mom, look what I found it this morning. Hmm, what, what is that? I'm not really sure, but it kind of makes me wonder what's inside. It sure does. Something really important must be in there. Should I open it? I think so, or we'll be stuck wondering about it all day. Okay. It's a box of rocks. I love rocks. <laughs> They're very smooth rocks. Hmm, they must have been touched quite a bit. Someone thinks these rocks are really important. And look, there is words written on these rocks. Those words are important. Okay, so we have five smooth stones that have something to stick, say. The first one here says learn. And then like the UU principle that encourage, encourages us to search for truth and meaning and to learn and grow spiritually. Hmm, learn. Well, the second smooth stone right here, it says being together is important. Hmm, that's certainly true. We've learned that over the past few years, that being in our UU community is important and sustaining for us. The third smooth, smooth stone says, 
how we are together and how that matters. Yeah, not just being together, but the way that we're together is important. Like how we believe in justity, justice and equity in our relationships. Yeah, and how we use the democratic process in our church to make decisions and share leadership. What does the fourth smooth stone say? Hmm, something about good. It says we do good and be good so that we feel good. Hmm, I think that means the reason why we strive to live our UU values is because it's what we want. Oh yeah, and the things I do in the way I am are my choices, and I choose to be that way because I want to, not because that's how someone else is telling me to do it. Hmm. And this last one, way down here, it's very light. It says, Hope. Hope for the present. And hope for the future. That's a big reason I come to here. I hope the world can be a better place. Turns, I, mm -hmm. We don't know. <laughs> Turns out these five smooth stones are pretty important. I, I would say each of these stones give us a lot to think about. I wonder which stone you think about. I wonder what these stones could mean for you. The kids and I will head back for some religious education or games, depending on how many of us there are. <laughs> On this Sunday after Thanksgiving, we extend our own note of gratitude. The financial health of this congregation is due to the generosity of our members and friends. We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we gather collectively do a greater good for ourselves and our world than they could have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. May we give in love and in hope. We also practice sharing our plate. One third of the undesignated funds collected during worship go to a local community group that is serving our area. For November, the recipient is East Bluff Community Center Food Pantry. They operate four Saturdays a month from 8.30 to noon. Guests select from a variety of food items and then receive a prepared bag along with a choice of meat and dessert. While food is prepared, guests are able to enjoy a good breakfast prepared by volunteers. For Share the Plate, two-thirds of the undesignated collection goes to the church, one-third to the East Bluff Community Center Food Pantry this month. Please use the envelopes to make your offering and indicate its use. See the QR code in the order of service to make an online donation. Thank you. The ushers will pass the collection plates. Will the ushers please come forward?
thank you for your generosity. Well, it's good to be with you all. Um, usually, I'm not on this side of the pulpit. Um, those of you who know me, I'm usually in the sanctuary on the Sundays I'm here uh, watching my wife preach. Uh, but I have been here before. Uh, some of you might remember. I actually got to preach here in 2005 or 6, uh, back when Michael Brown was on sabbatical. And this building was brand new. It still smelled like paint uh, when I got here. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again. We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of the open mind, the loving heart, and the helping hands. These are words of the chalice lighting that we teach our children, that was shown earlier, and they demonstrate many of the tenets of our faith. Where do these ideas come from in our tradition, and what does it mean for us to be a faith and communities of such generous approaches to life. The statements reflect basic tenets of religious liberal life. There are many definitions of liberal religion. One of the most elegant and complete definitions can be seen in the five statements about liberal religion made by Unitarian Universalist theologian James Luther Adams, which he referred to as the five smooth stones of liberal religion. James Luther Adams was a Unitarian parish minister, a social activist, a journal editor, a distinguished scholar, translator, and editor of major German theologians, prolific author, and divinity school professor for more than 40 years. Adams was a noted social ethicist and the most influential theologian among American Unitarian Universalists of the 20th century. He passed away in 1994. Now, the idea of the five smooth stones, which seems kind of weird, originates in the Hebrew Scriptures with the story of David and Goliath. You know, some of you remember that. And uh, as, I, uh, as told in Samuel 1, 17, where David collects five smooth stones for his sling for his upcoming battle with the giant Philistine Goliath. In brief, Adam's five smooth stones are, and you can find them on an insert in your order of service, by the way, so you have a take-home today. You can find, find these five smooth stones, and there's various state way of, uh, ways of stating them, so if it's slightly different from what I'm saying in your order of service, don't worry about it. The first one is, revelation and truth are not closed, but constantly revealed. The second one is, all relations between persons ought ideally to rest on mutual free consent and not coercion. Three, affirmation of the moral obligation to direct one's effort toward the establishment of a just and loving community. Four, is denial of the immaculate conception of virtue. I like that, the immaculate conception of virtue and the affirmation of the necessity of social incarnation. Good must be consciously given form and power within history. Things don't just happen. And five, the resources, divine and human, that are available for the achievement of meaningful change justify an attitude of ultimate but not necessarily immediate optimism. There is hope in the ultimate abundance of the universe. We can actually see some of this reflected in the phrase that the arc of the universe is long but bends towards justice, which was actually created by Theodor Parker, a Unitarian abolitionist and uh, used by Dr. King. The word liberal itself has some pretty bad press in recent years. Most of it is undeserved, and much of it is a consequence of political appropriation of the word by many parties. It has been associated with specific government policies and practices which have either been ineffective or are out of favor with popular culture. Basically, the baby got thrown out with the bathwater. In essence, liberal means open-minded, generous-spirited, kind-hearted, and open-handed. Now, if we combine this meaning of liberal with 
the meaning of religion, which is that which reconnects us or binds us back to that of ultimate importance, then liberal religion is a path and institutions which help us to reconnect or be aware of that which is of ultimate importance, the holy, through methods and principles which are open-minded, generous-spirited, kind-hearted, and open-handed, and ultimately optimistic. Now, just for the sake of clarity, the term orthodox comes from two root words, which mean right thought. And therefore, orthodox religions seek to reconnect us through the, to the ultimate by means of individuals holding what can be predetermined by some historical authority to be right thoughts or right beliefs. The Reverend William Sloan Coffin writes that, on the religious side, liberals believe that the integrity of your love is more important than the purity of dogma. The integrity of your love is more important than the purity of dogma. He says, dogma is a signpost, love is a hitching post. Liberals contend that we should sharpen our minds, not narrow them. And we understand that faith, far from clearing up uncertainty, makes it possible to live with uncertainty. Fundamentalists, on the other hand, he says, cannot bear uncertainty. They indulge in what psychiatrists call premature closure. Liberals contend that one of the most wonderful things about life is to act wholeheartedly without absolute certainty. I think that would be a very interesting conversation to have over a Christmas meal. As religious liberals and Unitarian Universalists, we are a religion of doubters. We do not claim to have all of the answers because we know that no one does. Those who claim to have all the answers actually have one less than those of us who know they don't know at all. Liberal religion says that we can know some truths, plural, little t, not all truth, singular, capital T. Even if perfect knowledge or divine truth were given to human beings, as some claim they are through various scriptures, we human beings are imperfect, finite, and fallible creatures who could not understand it or interpret it perfectly. There is no way that we can inherently know the mind of God, however we may conceptualize it. For us, the fallible, to claim infallibility for the infinite, to claim, for the finite, excuse me, to claim perfect understanding of the infinite, quite simply, is idolatry. Again, another good conversation at Christmas. The setting up of something less than the ultimate in the place of the ultimate is idolatry. And therefore, things like claims of scriptural literalism and inerrancy are not only illogical, they are also arrogant. If there is a sacrilege in liberal religion, it's this type of claim. Now, it's easy to stand forth and point fingers at others, especially if they deserve it. But as the old saying goes, when we point one finger at someone, there are three more pointing back at us. Yeah, that's right, three. Um, we may be able to justify critiquing others, but intellectual, philosophical, and religious honesty require that we must be willing to submit ourselves to the same analysis. The self-critical functions of liberal religion are in many ways its definitive hallmarks. Self-reflection and self-criticism allow for correction, increased understanding, innovation, and renewal. No form of liberal religion is final. As Adam says, none of them is exempt from change. The moment any one of them is taken for final, liberalism lapses into orthodoxy. We are not believers in some immutable static truth closed for all time or even closed off for a little while. Revelation is not closed. No truth, understanding, new truth, 
understanding, and grace are constantly being revealed to us through us and all of creation. This is why we say we have a living tradition. Our current covenant, which we refer to as our principles and purposes, were originally installed in the 1950s, in 1985, after a lengthy process of discussion and debate over several years. Some of you remember those conversations. They have come to be a major theological touchstone for us as a liberal religious movement. When I started in seminary, they were barely seven years old. Actually, five. And so now here we are at the other end of that. But they're not written in stone. And as a faith, we are now involved in a project of renewing and reviewing and completely revising them in what is referred to as the Article II process. I believe uh, Reverend Jennifer has given you a sermon on this, and there's articles and things about this. And there will be probably more congregational conversations about this. The very themes that we are currently using in our sermons right now reflect the values that are being articulated in the Article II process. One of the side concerns of many of my colleagues is that it would be healthy to see a change in this document of ours, not only because the issues involved, but because it would tend to undercut a rising tendency to see this document as a fixed and inviolate creed instead of the reflection of a living covenant. We human beings, and as religious liberals, are about change. Not change for its own sake, but being able to recognize it and utilize it for the good. Like surfing a wave, occasionally we wipe out. Now, like James Luther Adams pointing to our failures in the earlier part of our century, through our naive liberalism of constant progress onward, upward, forever, I mean, people actually talked about this and talked in this way about the liberal project before World War I. They talked about onward, upward, forever. I mean, that's kind of arrogant, actually, when you think about it. And it's sort of begging God to thump you on the head. We had to learn that recognizing and respecting the inherent worth and dignity of others does not mean ignoring and or denying the equally inherent capacity of human beings for evil. We are seeing this now played out in all of the drama in the conflict in Gaza. That's why it's so complicated. There is an ongoing necessity to make our principles and our actions relevant for the spiritual and ethical demands of a changing and historical situation, says Adams. As a people of the loving heart, we reflect Adams' second and third stones that all relations between persons ought ideally rest on mutual free consent and not on coercion, and affirmation of the moral obligation to direct one's effort towards the establishment of a just and loving community. Liberal religion is important and relevant precisely because it allows us to live and be empowered to change the world for the betterment of all in any age. As our pace of life accelerates, the need for a flexible but coherent method of making ethical and moral choices is paramount. Fixed and rigid systems cannot respond quickly enough to changing conditions. They, though they try, and they may replace reflective consideration with efficiency, and management, all our considerations must reflect the loving heart. This then leads us to the third part of that chalice lighting, that we are a people of the helping hands, and Adams's fourth smooth stone of liberal religion. He calls it the denial of the immaculate conception of virtue, an affirmation of the necessity of social incarnation. Good must consciously be given form and power within history. Basically, this means that universe, the universe 
does not protect us from bad things, and that God's hands are the ones at the ends of our own wrists. If our lives are not to be managed either by fascists and theocratic politicians or by multinational corporations, it is up to us to live our lives in ways which will make us all better for having lived them. One of the most important things about this chalice lighting that we teach our children is its very first word. Now, we, we, as a culture dominated by toxic and exploitative versions of individualism, this is an important reframing of our basic understanding of relationships. Adams might say that we need to die to who we are and to let go of our past conceptions of acceptable relationships. We need to let go of the orthodoxies of class, race, gender identities, and economic systems in which we are all so entrenched and have so identified with and which cage our spirits and that of our current world. Our rejection, only a rejection, of the mythic individualism which says despairingly to us that we stand alone. We are failures unless we do. This false understanding of the individual keeps us weak and afraid and invested in the status quo rather than prophetically working for the realization of the beloved community. It is important to note that the chalice lighting says we are a people, not the people. Now, there are multiple versions of this. I've gone online since I researched this, and I found that there are both the people, we are the people, and we are a people. And I would make the pitch for we are a people and not the people because we are the only ones, because we are not the only ones to have and practice many of these beliefs. There are liberal practitioners of many faiths. The Unitarians helped found what is now the International Association of Religious Freedom, the oldest international and interfaith organization in the world. It has 46 member organizations in 19 countries, speaking more than 20 languages, with nine chapters in four global regions. Now, I will say that we probably take the practice of being open-minded part of things further than most groups. That is in great part because unlike most groups, we are explicitly pluralistic in our approaches to understanding and understanding our relationships to the holy and the universe. Now, that aside, we are not the only ones. And this, again, reinforces the understanding of not being alone in the universe, either in a deluded sense of specialness or in some sense of isolation. We are not the only ones and we are not alone. And this is important for us as Unitarian Universalists because sometimes in our congregations we get this sense that we are the, the special but determined underdog, you know, and that we're out there, you know, chewing away on things for, for the good of all and we're the only ones doing it. And that's simply not true. We have many relationships with other faiths ongoing in this city and in other places around the country who also have many of these liberal religious traditions. We are not alone. Now, the easy use of religious language of God is God, the holy, which we and the Orthodox do while perpetrating incarnations of injustice only serve to sanctify the cages that separate us from freedom and community, says Adams. Easy talk about the celebration alone of things such as tolerance, Justice, human rights, worth and dignity, etc., as Adam puts it, only exemplifies the hypocrisy and the spiritual impotence of a moribund religion. All of these cages prevent the flight of the spirit, the flight of eagles that mount up on wings of eagles that swoop down straight. The power of liberal religion is to see that these cages are just that, cages. Not divine rights to unbridled wealth, power, or rampant individualism, or to choices without consequences in a larger setting. 
They are not the ultimate, but only idols of our own, built out of our desires, but mostly built out of our fears. Our fears of inadequacy, our fears of not getting enough, our fears of being alone, our fears of not being loved. There is, as James Luther Adams asserts, a, quote, neurotic yearning for security which has developed in an age of convolutions. It is clear, he says, the yearning is neurotic for it fervidly rejects patient discussion as tedious and frustrating. How many of you have been in sessions with people where you're talking about things and people say, enough talk, we have to get moving, we have to act. And I think Act Adams would say, you need that patient discussion to find the right way to go do things, because otherwise you're acting neurotically. Adams continues, he says, the power to break through these cages is a power that is accessible only to a liberalism that surrenders to more, something more potent than itself. It is accessible only to those who know their own sickness, who know their false faiths are false. Only when we are courageous enough to patiently, deliberately, and self-reflectively challenge ourselves and our assumptions to come to broader justice and deeper truths, individually and collectively, will we experience the salvation, the liberation from injustice, and the renewal of our world, which is the promise of liberal religion. Whether we are counting out the five smooth stones of James Luther Adams or using other definitions of liberal religion, the impulse and the calling to do justice and walk humbly with the universe are the same. As we struggle to understand ourselves and each other and to break the cages of repression and incarnate the good, let us not doubt the connectedness to and the ultimate abundance of the universe which we call holy. Because we are Unitarian Universalists, a people of the open mind, the loving heart, and the helping hands. So be it. Now we invite you to please rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn. It's number 1018 in the Teal Hymnal. Come and go with me. And uh, please rise and we'll sing together.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. and hands and minds renewed to the world that is waiting for you. Go out to that world to bring your gentle touch to those in pain. Go out to feed and house those in need. Go out to speak truth to those in power. Go out with courage to do the work which calls you. Go out now with your passion and faith to change the world. Amen, and blessed be, go in peace.